We talk about environment, it's your pet area, but you're on the gender committee. Gender agenda seems to be the trending hashtag. Your party nominated a woman to yes. be your running mate. Yes. Um, some people actually thought you would make it. You said so. Did, did, did people <laughs> think so? Did people approach you saying that, hey, Doc, you should consider this position? How do I consider a position? It's not mine to consider, I mean, is maybe it? they'll just say, prepare yourself. Or, <laughs> okay, let me ask. Has a flag bearer spoken to you? No. Any member of the party spoken to you? <laughs> no. Is it a position you would have loved to take? Um, you know, I think that's a tricky question. We have a, f a running mate. She's a woman. She understands a lot of women's issues. She's been a an academic for the longest time. She was an appointee in the previous NDC government. I think at this point in time, what's important is we have a woman who's very qualified and um, to give our support to her to do what she has to do. The, when I hear phrases like gender agenda, explain that to us. Does it mean regardless of what she has, the fact that she's a woman, she should be voted for. Is that the argument of people who are pro-gender? Um, perhaps we should move away from her strictly and just make it general. As you look in the, whether it's in the leadership space of politics or corporate, there are not enough women anywhere, except for where a lot of the heavy lifting is happening. And it means that women's issues are not necessarily being represented fairly at the decision-making level. Gender is not just about women, by the way. Gender is about men and women. But in Ghana, as with many other countries, we don't have enough women in the decision-making places so that we can make sure that that balance is restored. You know, so I think it's really a case of, yes, we need to have a, a combination of the two in terms of, um, and hence this affirmative action bill, which, you know, has been dancing around in the periphery, which at some point really needs to take center stage because um, we do need to have more women represented. Because when you ask a question like, is it just about filling w the slots with women or getting qualified women? Um, with all due respect, are all the men in all the positions as qualified as they should be for the positions? You know, we seem to view women through a jaded lens when it comes to their deserving of positions or otherwise. So we need to ensure that as women, we are empowering ourselves. We're making sure that as many women mm -hmm. are empowered, you know, we build capacity so that when they do find themselves in those positions, they are capable of executing whatever mandate that they are given. Mm -hmm. But we must also consider the fact that because there's an imbalance, we do need to make room for women to fill certain slots anyway, which is what the affirmative action bill is about. Let's talk about your running mate. So she's been appointed or named as a running mate. Mm. She may be a good vice president, but is she a good running mate? And when I ask whether she's a good running mate, is she the one who can win you the seat? Is she very political? Does she know how to win the votes first of all before she becomes vice president? You've mentioned that she's an academic. She's not a politician. How does an academic win an election? You're asking me to make a prediction on what she can do. She's only just been nominated. Um, she's being introduced to various traditional leaders and everything. And I think so far she has conducted herself well. So I think we give her the benefit of the doubt and see what she does. Because um, I don't know if you'd have asked me this if she was a man. Mm, because you introduced <laughs> it. And so I, I just thought I should ask you, uh, if, she's, if she was a man and she was not political, it would still be the same question to ask. It's like the question that was asked of Mills when he was brought in to be running mate mm. in the 96 elections. He was, he was not a politician. But Dr. Baumia, the same thing was said in mm. 2008. He was not a politician. But in 2016, you wouldn't ask a question if Baumia is a politician. So that's what I'm asking. How easy a task it would be for your party to win the power, considering that you have a former MP, former vice president, former president as your ticket main. But then you have a running mate who is an academic. That's what I'm asking that. I think we'll have to wait and see. Because um, to, to prejudge a situation where you haven't given the benefit of the doubt, I think is unfair. Mm. Um, and the very fact that we're having this conversation still points back to the fact that it's because she's a woman. Okay. You know, um, let's, let's, let's give that opportunity and then let us, let us make a judgment in a month and a half or in two months' time or okay. in December okay. to and see what happens. Environment, in the, in the committee that you served on, was there any national agenda you've been able to push through as a member of the Environment Committee that excites you sitting here? You say, 
oh, I'm happy that my committee worked on ABCD and is going to better the environment of Ghana? One of the main things that um, I'm quite happy about that my committee was working on was the issue of how we deal with waste. Um, because um, last year, the committee did a field trip where basically Ghana's waste, most of it ends up in landfills. If we were segregating our waste, a lot more could be recycled, a lot more could be reduced, reused, and um, also the, um, the policy on plastics. That's another thing that um, is of importance because we are literally drowning in plastics. When it rains, I just shudder because my constituency just becomes inundated with filth and mm. plastics from other places mm. and from the constituency as well. You know, we're a low-lying area. We end up with a lot of refuse coming downstream from, from as high up as the mountains. Mm. You know, so it's, it's actually quite, it's traumatic when it rains. And, um, the, the solution for many is to ban plastic entirely, but the Minister for Environment didn't give us the indication that will be happening soon. What do you make of that? To be, to be honest, it's something, I almost sound like a broken record because it's something that I've been advocating since I actually went into Parliament. If it's not a case of a total ban, it has to be some sort of um, you know, ban of single-use plastics and um, or you know certain types of plastics not being allowed to be used anymore and being um, you know other forms of reusable material you know when when we were much younger in school we used to make these raffia mm -hmm. you know baskets mm -hmm. sisal can also be used jute sacks you know so there are different ways that we can create a change in the paradigm with which we approach the use of things so that back in the day you were going to the market you had a bag and that bag lasted because that was the market basket, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And um, now you, you go and buy wachi and the, the oil is wrapped up in a, a plastic bag and yeah. then the rice in a plastic bag and then the, the noodles in a plastic bag and then you have the you whole thing so, you in another bag. You have soup in plastic bag yet. Oh, Wait boy. until you see oh, that. Boy. And then, and then you know, I'm going to move out of it's, it's unfortunate because, mm -hmm. you know, we used to have all of that in the leaf. If you go to Malaysia, if you go to Indonesia and Thailand and a lot of these places, they still sell, sell these things mm. in the banana leaf. Mm. Why, why do we believe that development means leaving behind certain things that are actually environmentally friendly, that are sustainable, and that are basically beautiful? Mm. You know, if we, if we actually encourage that a lot more, you know, and once upon a time when I was a child as well, if you wanted to go and buy food and, you know, one of the street vendors or something, you could go with your own bowl. Mm. You know, That's maybe we need now. to, no, we need to, we, we okay. need to look at some of these things again. I need to move away from Parliament That's so we get fine. into your concerns, but there's one question I want a yes or no answer. Did you get preferential treatment because of your surname in Parliament? No. No. <laughs> this is Face to Face on City TV. My name is Umaru Sandamad. My guest is Dr. Zanda Tajiman Rollins. She's MP, Kole Klote, NDC parliamentary candidate for this same conference in December 11.